all that people sometimes go through in middle class society to find a name that nobody else has. That is unique. Roger, India is very posh now. The new statesman and guardian are full of Indians. Call us. So you started something. No, I didn't. There was already India Hicks. Ah, you're right. Those bloody Hicks, that bloody Hicks family beat me (laughs) to it to the tune of one girl, (laughs) India, (laughs) who's now a mature woman, I would guess, probably. This whole conversation started, it was inspired by my nameplate, huh? That reminds you of a book. Yeah, Yeah, the Miko (laughs) Palaid. I'm about... I'll be doing this the whole time. Well, Ray's got the beard for it, you see. That's right. If if anybody looked like... (laughs) It's not Ray McGovern. It's Ben fucking Gunn. Look. (laughs) I love Treasure Island. It's one of my favourite questions. Here we go. What was the name of the pirate (laughs) who shinned up the mainmast and pinned Jim, whatever his name was, to the mast with his knife? Hawkins. Uh, Yeah. What's Hawkins? What was the name of the pirate? Yeah, the pirate who went up. Yeah. Are you saying you don't know? I don't know. I've forgotten. Great boy. The gloat. Roger's going to gloat. I'm going to tell you. You ready? <laughs> you will remember as soon as I say it. Israel hands. All right. See? Click, click, click. Wheels turn. Israel hands, eh? And they, they pirate. lay dead on the floor while Jim Hawkins sailed the Hispaniola single-handed round the corner to the other bay. Yeah. Not All right, fellas, people. we are we are at that time. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> I wish we could just go on like that. <laughs> this right? has just been renamed. Discussion <laughs> on Treasure Island. <laughs> uh, feel free to detour it there. If, if, Somebody if, remind if, me if what it is that we're, going to, that we're supposed to be talking about since I'm hosting this thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll just wing it, you know. Okay. All right. I'm going to take us live here. And what I'm going to do is just do a quick one, two minute intro. I'm going to pass the reins off to Miko. Miko's going to take over and then I'll pop back in for the Q&A. Um, John, you're trying to, you're, you're at one hour, right? Yeah, I, I pro- probably can run over it. At this okay. time, you've got questions. Me too. Me too. Hour. Me too. Okay. I've run over, but not for hours and hours and hours. No. no. Well, so, you, let's have web, the patience for webinars. They can go of, on. No, no, no. We'll do a couple of good questions. We filter the questions. Do a couple of good yeah. ones, and that's it. Can okay. we stop at an hour and fifteen or twenty or something? Okay. Yeah, that'll be that'll be tough. Will to live then. We're probably (laughs) live. They're all watching us arguing about how long we can stay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. All right. I'm gonna take us live. (laughs) Okay. We are live. I am just gonna give it another 15 seconds or so so that folks can stream into the event. And we do have a lot of people registered for this one. Um, Please remember that if you can't get in for some reason or if you didn't register ahead of time, you can access this via Miko Peled's YouTube channel. You can just do a quick search on YouTube for Miko Peled, find the official channel. Uh, And uh, of course, we will make this recording available afterwards. Um, And let's go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the trial of Julian Assange. This is an online event hosted by author and activist Miko Peled. My name is Jamil, and I'll be your event admin today, along with my friend Michael. So if you need assistance during the course of the event, you can send us a private message or just address us in the chat room. Both of us will have the word uh, event admin next to our names if you want to ID us. So this is the 10th online event in Miko Peled's webinar series, and it just so happens that this is easily the highest number of registrants we have had to date. Uh, Might have something to do with our panel, but we think it's also likely related to the near mainstream media blackout in regards to this important topic. 
So I don't want to take up too much time here. I just want to thank the audience for tuning in for this important discussion. I also want to thank the excellent panel that we're fortunate enough to have with us today. We have three prominent activists who have persistently advocated for Julian Assange's release and freedom since he took refuge in the Embassy of Ecuador in London in June 2012. And I'd like to introduce them to you all. So we have Roger Waters, of course, songwriter, musician, uh, co-founder of Pink Floyd, and human rights activist. We have John Pilger, journalist, writer, documentary filmmaker. And of course, we have Ray McGovern, ex-CIA, presidential briefer, writer, and human rights activist. And as always, we have author and activist Miko Pellet, who is best known for his work advocating for Palestinian justice and freedom. And Miko is going to be today's host. And I'd like just like to preliminarily prelim, preliminarily thank Roger for uh, sporting a kafia in the ba background of his video. Um, so thank you to the panel um, for their time and participation. We're really looking forward to your insights and your analysis. Uh, a little housekeeping before I hand things over to Miko. We are live streaming this event to Miko Pellet's YouTube page, like I said before. So if you want to share this event with folks who didn't register ahead of time, uh, send them over to youtube.com slash C slash Miko Pellet official. We're going to get that URL in the chat room so you can copy and paste it. And you'll be able to watch the live stream from there. We also make all these webinars available to rewatch uh, after the fact. So just give me a couple of days to get that up. And, and um, I assure you it will be up and edited. So after the discussion wraps up, we will move into an audience Q&A. So hit that Q&A button in your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions at any point during the event. And I think we are ready to start here. So I'm going to pass the reins over to Miko Pellet. Thank you, Jamil. Thanks for your help. Uh, thank you, Michael, behind the scenes for your help. And thank you, gentlemen, for, for your, you know, giving us your precious time to talk about this. I know all three of you uh, feel very strongly about this issue. All of us also share a very strong um, uh, feelings, um, and we all act on the issue of justice for Palestine, so we all have that in common as well. Um, the issue of Julian Assange, you know, considering the impact that he's had, considering what he's going through personally as a result of that, the price that he's paying, um, number one, I think it's, it's it, and you probably agree with me, that it's criminal the way his story is being completely ignored by the mainstream media, and even the alternative media, there's not really a lot um, being said and a lot being reported about his case. And it's, it's, it's come to the point where I talk to people who are actually knowledgeable about issues and they don't know who Julian is or maybe they've heard his name but they don't really know what he did or they confuse him with Snowden and wait a minute, is he the guy from here? Is he the guy from there? And, um, and uh, it's, it's tragic, it's criminal. And um, again, considering the enormous impact that he's had and the enormous price that he's paying personally for what he did, um, we owe him at least to, uh, to have, uh, to have a, a lively debate, uh, a public debate on, on what, is, what he's done and what he's, um, what he's suffering and why. Uh, which is why you know, we put together um, this fantastic panel. So I'd like to cover a few, you know, as much as possible in the limited time that we have. I think it's crucial to talk about his contributions as a journalist, uh, the campaign and the persecution that he's gone through th for, for, for many years, um, why he was evicted from the embassy of Ecuador, why he is in a cell in a British, in a, in, in a British high security prison. Um, we know that now we're waiting for the British court to decide whether or not he will be extradited. So we need to discuss what happens if he is, what happens if he isn't. And what I find consider terribly troubling is also the fact that so few journalists are actually standing up for him. So John, I thought we'd start with you. Perhaps you can, if you could, give us an idea of the, his contribution to journalism as a journalist, uh, what did he actually do? What did he do for us as a journalist? Uh, how important is it? Um, and uh, and uh, what is it that he's done that has brought him to the place where he's, where he's being punished like this? Well, he started uh, being a real journalist and we've been lacking in real journalists for such a long time. Um, the uh, today all the spaces that were 
in the misnamed mainstream media have closed. People like myself, others who worked through the so-called mainstream for many years uh, are not there anymore. And one of the reasons is that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks exposed the whole media system as an extension of great power. Uh, a few years ago, yes, as I say, there were spaces for some of us to, to criticize that, to report from places we thought honestly. Uh, Julian has, has given journalism the, uh, the kind of good name that it's denied itself for such a long time. For one thing, he revolutionized journalism. He invented you, this. I'm sorry, you were muted for a moment. Go ahead. He, he revolutionized journalism. He invented this fail-safe method of, of people being able, people within systems being able to whistle blow uh, and not reveal their identity. Uh, now, most of us, certainly in my case, throughout my career, most of the best stories, if you like, scoops that I've had have come from people within systems. Julian and WikiLeaks produce more scoops in a short space of time, all of them authentic, all of them telling us something that we needed to know, all of them giving us a glimpse of how governments behave behind our backs, how they start wars based on lies, all the very things that journalists are meant to call them out on. Julian and WikiLeaks did this in a very short space of time. So he did real journalism. And when you ask, Miko, why um, journalists, or you queried why journalists hadn't support him, because he shames them. I believe he shames journalists. He shames uh, those who are often overpaid, under-talented, uh, in, uh, in, in who, have, who have these exalted platforms, particularly in Western countries, in this country, Britain, in, in the United States, on great tome-like newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, he shamed them with real journalism. How did he do this? Uh, words, how did he? How did he? How was he able to expose all this information? Well, he he did, as I say, he 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 invented the <laughs> Ju Ju Julian's. Um, I suppose his his genius, in a way, is inventing something that so many media organisations have now adopted. And that's basically a fail-safe drop box where people within governments, within systems could, could drop in something that needed to be told that they felt as conscientious objectors needed to be told about that organization uh, that blew the whistle on them. And as I said, whistleblowers have been the, uh, the staple of real journalism for a very long time, but there've been so few of them because it's a very dangerous, uh, it's a very dangerous pursuit as of course we now know uh, from Julian's uh, suffering, from the suffering of Chelsea Manning. Um, and, uh, but, but, but so, so he gave us, if you take just one example, the infamous collateral murder video, that in a very short space of time uh, told us how America conducts its colonial wars. It conducts it in a homicidal way. I reported Vietnam for over 10 years, and I can assure you there were plenty of collateral murders, but we didn't we weren't in the cockpit with them. We weren't able to get hold of, uh, of, of that kind of evidence. 
Other evidence was forthcoming, of course, famously with the Milai massacre and so on. But that's how colonial wars as such are conducted and the way the United States treats so much of the world. There it was, if you like, in a nutshell, in this horrific episode where the crew of the Apache helicopter gloated at shooting down civilians in the street in Baghdad, including children. Uh, that, uh, I mean, that was, that was vivid, but there's so much else. He, uh, he exposed that uh, uh, the, the long running, for instance, uh, Chilquot inquiry in this country into uh, Blair's invasion with Bush of Iraq in 2003, how it was rigged to appease American interests. Uh, he, he, exposed, he, she exposed the Chilcot report as being rigged. Yeah, as being rigged, sure. The, and, and I mean, we'd be here all night if I yeah. went yeah, into that, how he did it, but I mean, in, in ticking off, there are so many of these. Mm -hmm. uh, he exposed how the British Army, year after year, uh, in Helmand province in Afghanistan, was a disaster and, and enjoyed the United States in, uh, in, in so many war crimes against the people of Afghanistan. That was exposed. Uh, he exposed how Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, ordered the theft of, 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 uh, of, of, of credit card details and ID information from um, um, everyone up to Ang Angela Merkel and people in the United States and so on and so forth. Uh, you, you mentioned Hillary Clinton. I want to throw this question at you. Um, I think I know what you're going to say, but there's a, there's a theory out there that he was working for the Russians that he was somehow collaborating for the Russians, which is- It's not a theory, Miko, it's just crap, frankly, sorry. I was crap. right, that's what I thought. It's a good word. Yeah. It, there's no evidence, mm -hmm. there's no theory, it never happened. He didn't work, Ray is an expert on this. Uh, he never worked for the Russians, it's ludicrous. My God, they tried though, the Guardian newspaper invented a story that a bunch of Russians, with Paul Manafort, the, uh, an advisor to Trump, turned up at the Ecuadorian embassy and put it all over the front page. It never happened. Fake news, quintessential mm -hmm. fake news. Well, since you mentioned Ray, let's move on to Ray. So let me ask you this, as, as someone who's worked on the inside and has worked as, a, as an analyst for many years, a CIA analyst, um, is there any foundation to, um, to the claim that what he did um, is 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 um, deserving of uh, prosecution, and I'll just say I'll just before you answer, I just want to just just um, mention that I'm grateful. Ray organized a meeting for me with Julian while Julian was still at the uh, Ecuadorian embassy, and I I'm very grateful for that. So I, so thank you. I just wanted to to put that out there. But do you think that what he did, what he exposed, is deserving of, of prosecution, not to say persecution? Right? Oh, you're asking me? Yes. Of course I'm not. Sorry, yes. Uh, of course not. Um, what he exposed was the truth. Uh, this is something in very short supply uh, these days. Uh, as John has so eloquently stated, uh, it's a marginalization of people who speak the truth. You know, uh, back in the exposed secrets that were dangerous to the state and therefore is deserving of, of, of prosecution. That's the claim that's out there. Very briefly, uh, after the war logs came out on Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, a lot of the people were screaming, oh, he's endangering lives, he's endangering sources and methods and so forth. And finally, uh, Senator Levin, uh, head of the Armed Services Committee at the time, said, hey, Mr. Gates, Secretary of Defense, uh, give us a memo on that, will you? And this is what uh, Gates said. Uh, These charges are, quote, significantly overwrought. 
end quote. <laughs> okay. The charges against Julian. Yeah, so he said that, you know, uh, what, what happened was not only he said that, but the head of the NATO forces in Afghanistan said them, and so did the uh, uh, US Army commander of that part of the world. So uh, those are unsubstantiated uh, charges that don't hold, uh, don't hold water. And I was really shocked that the uh, uh, Queen's prosecutor started out with that at the late, latest round with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Julian. It's crazy. It doesn't hold water. And you have the Secretary of Defense saying that. So um, let me ask you as well, the whole Russia theory. You write a lot about Russia and the whole Russia gate issue. You are a Russia expert. Is there any reason to assume that, uh, is there any reason to believe that these claims have, have are founded? Well, I like uh, John Pilger's long-winded answer to that. It's crap. I mean, you want to blacken somebody? <laughs> you want to say they're identified with Russia? It's really, really crazy. I have friends that think I'm working for Vladimir Putin, and these are not dumb friends. They just, you know, every <laughs> now and then, Trump says something that is correct. Okay, it's only two percent of the time, but you know, if it's if it matters, you need to give him credit for that. And Russia Gate, of course, he's correct on. So, you know, it is real, really a problem getting the, the information out there so Americans can understand what's really going on. You know, Edmund Burke back in the late what, 18th century talked about the fourth estate, those gentlemen in the balcony who are more important than all three estates at the time in parliament. Well, there, there was a fifth estate created by Julian Assange. It still exists, but that fifth estate is so dangerous to the powers that be uh, that they, they, they try to cramp, clamp down on it and make an example of Julian. This is what happens to you if you dare to reveal secrets like collateral murder. I would, I would add that uh, on collateral murder, we know there was a Washington Post correspondent with that same unit. We know that he saw the video. We know that he didn't say anything. We know that he wrote a book about this unit and call it the good soldiers. Yes, yep. there it is, okay? There's the, the, uh, the abrogation of responsibility by the, by the mainstream press. Well, the collusion actually, Ray. That's right. I would go more than abrogation, collusion. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, this fellow whose name was Finkel, uh, he's we're, risen far, far high in the Washington Post circles and I think he got a Nobel Prize, or <laughs> Nobel, but a Pulitzer for that. And uh, it's really very insidious. It's very incestuous. And it's, uh, you know, I would like to, if I may, Miko, uh, adduce one small example uh, of the kind of material uh, that came out of the uh, State Department cables, which I found really, really interesting from a uh, Russian analyst point of view. M may I do that? Please. <clears throat> okay. Well, this had to do with uh, the, the, the question as to whether Ukraine and Georgia could become part of NATO. Now, NATO had already doubled in size, uh, despite George H.W. Bush's promise to Gorbachev, we won't move one inch to the east of Germany if you allow the reunification of Germany. So it already doubled. And then all about uh, 2008, there became rumors and then reports, Ukraine is going to apply for membership in NATO, okay? So on the 1st of February, uh, Sergei Lavrov, newly appointed foreign minister, says, uh, 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 call, call Bill Burns. I need to talk to the uh, U.S. ambassador. Burns goes in and he says, Mr. Burns, do you know what NET means? <laughs> now we have this in Burns' cable courtesy, Bradley or Schultz Manning and WikiLeaks. Uh, yes, I think I know what net means. Well, net means net. You, you report to your superiors that if you enlarge NATO to include Ukraine and Georgia, there'll be real trouble. We'll have to decide whether to intervene in Ukraine. Net means net. Tell your folks back home that. So now I have to say that Bill Burns, uh, one of the better foreign service officers, did a well, he told it straight. He told, uh, I guess it was Condoleezza Rice at that time, look, 
you better not try this. The Russians have real security concerns here. It would be sort of like a Cuba, a Cuba incident here uh, with the uh, arm impinging on their regional uh, perspectives. So what happened? Well, uh, on two, two months later, on April 3rd, 2008, NATO declared in its formal declaration, NATO, uh, Ukraine and Georgia will become part of NATO, period. Whoa. So were we warned about that? Yes, we were warned. That was 2008. Now, 2013 comes along. And because Putin helped pull Obama's chestnuts out of the fire with respect to making war on Syria for this false flag chemical attack outside Damascus in August of 2013, Putin says, look, Miss, Mr. Obama, uh, we can we can figure this out because we've got a working group. We can destroy all those residual, those archaic uh, uh, Syrian chemical weapons on a boat under UN supervision on one of your one of your ships here that's specifically outfitted for such destruction. Uh, you think that'd be a good idea? And Obama breathes a sigh of relief and goes, oh, wow, I don't have to start another war after all. I can do this. Now, why do I mention that? Because on, in early September 2013, the New York Times published an op-ed by Putin. And he said, you know, I'm really delighted that uh, there's a growing trust between our countries and between uh, Mr. Obama and me personally. Whoa, that can't be allowed. But who's going to be able to sell arms to Europe if the, the Russians have a growing trust with the U.S. and vice versa? So what happened? Well, <laughs> five, six months later, there's the coup in Ukraine. Now, this all is the context in which this happens. The coup in Ukraine and, of course, Russia seized uh, Crimea or Sevastopol, the, the naval port that they're there, uh, that they've had since Catherine the Great. It's only warm water naval base. And so the, 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 the nail kinds had their way. Uh, the, the warming or the growing trust was dissipated. MH17 comes along. Even the Europeans are persuaded by the United States to, to cut off their nose to spite their face, to in introduce very stringent sanctions that help the Europeans more uh, as much as the, the, that hurt the Europeans as much as the Russians. So, you know, uh, from looking at that one cable, and if I've seen uh, one cable from Embassy Moscow, I've probably seen about several thousand, okay? It's genuine. And that goes to the root of this thing. You know, does Julian doctor what he puts out? Does he embellish it or comment on it? Hell no. And I want to point out here, because it's very ironic, uh, he got a left-handed compliment from my old colleagues at the CIA. And what was that compliment? Well, in this community assessment about Russian interference. The date was 6 January 2017. They said, oh, the Russians hacked. Of course, they didn't. I hope you all know that. They didn't. Okay. The Russians hacked and gave it to WikiLeaks. Why did they give it to WikiLeaks? Well, I have the answer right here. That's precisely the claim. That's precisely the claim that's out there. Yeah. Okay. But this is why they gave it to WikiLeaks, according to the analysts of CIA, uh, NSA, and FBI. Moscow most likely chose WikiLeaks because of its self-proclaimed reputation for authenticity. Disclosures through WikiLeaks did not contain any evident forgeries. <laughs> okay, well, let's get rid of the adjectives here. I mean, uh, Julian bragged, and he had every reason to brag, about 100% accurate record. I'm trying to say record the correct way. Okay, it is 100%. Okay, and that's why when you look at WikiLeaks material, including the DNC emails that WikiLeaks published, didn't get from Russian, but they published it and showed that Hillary had stolen the nomination from Bernie Sanders. That really hurts Hillary. Okay, so all these things come into play. And uh, I, it's really very unfortunate that, uh, well, unfortunate is, is a doubt least uh, one could say it's tragic you know i just want to finish here with my little thing on on uh, what it reminds me is uh it reminds me of 
of the death of a salesman, you know, um, Arthur Miller, um, he has a, he, he quotes Willie Loman's wife. I don't want to screw it up. So I, I'm going to read it here. Uh, Willie, Willie Loman's wife cries out in, in agony. He's a human being and a terrible thing is happening to him. So attention must be paid. He's not to be allowed to fall into his grave like an old dog. Attention, attention must be paid, must be finally paid to such a person. Now that goes in spades for Julian Assange, our mutual friend, and attention must be paid. And it's too bad that it's just us doing it, but we have to break into uh, the consciousness of, of uh, people who care about justice and make sure that Julian is vindicated. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Um, Roger, I, um, so you've been involved in so many issues as an activist, but you know, Palestine, of course, has been something that you, you, you put yourself out on a limb, supporting BDS, supporting, uh, you know, being out there with your kofia in, 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 in concerts and so on. Now you're advocating for probably the most controversial guy on earth, uh, Julian Assange. Can you tell us a just talk a little about, about your work uh, in regard to Julian, uh, how you got involved. Why, why do you feel so strongly about, uh, about speaking up for, for Julian Assange? I could attempt that, but I'm not going to because I've been listening to the testimony from these two great men and uh, it's so far beyond my ken. They have a grip on detail that I know all about, all of the detail that both John and Ray have shared with us here and it's extremely uh, obviously important and and it's great stuff to know and whatever so i thank them both for 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 that for reiterating i've heard it many many times before because i live in your world i live in the world that we live in the four the five of us sitting here today we live in a world that most people do not inhabit sadly if people lived in our world, this program is called, I've just looked at it up here, The Trial of Julian Assange. If most people lived in the world that you and I inhabit, it would go something like this. It wouldn't, Vanessa, whatever name, Beretzer is her name, who is the judge who will decide upon Julian Assange's fate on her fucking own, this woman. If she wasn't the judge, if I was the judge and if the world understood all the things that Ray and John and Miko and Roger understand, it would go something like this. And I'm quoting myself here now. It would go, the evidence before the court is incontrovertible. There's no need for the jury to retire. Case dismissed. <laughs> and that would be the fucking end of it. Because this is <laughs> such a put up kangaroo court piece yes. of bollocks that so none of us should be taking it even faintly seriously yes. so our our dilemma here is that we have to because it's the reality of our lives Vanessa Beretzer will do her thing obviously in January she's going to come out where she's going to sit between now and January and we all knew what she was going to write six months ago it's a complete charade but why, why is it then that every journalist in the world isn't standing up for, for Julian Assange, a completely innocent man? I've got a little anecdote, which again has nothing to do with this miraculously delivered detail of this. Sometime in the summer of 2019, I'd been on tour for a couple of years. I came back to the United States, sitting in the sunshine, looking at the lovely view outside my lovely house with some painter chap here with his girlfriend blah 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 a couple of glasses of wine i bring up assange oh christ have you seen what's happened now isn't it awful blah blah blah, blah. and this woman who may be perfectly nice i don't know i'd never met her before and i've never met her again suddenly went oh do you think so i said what are you talking about well he did rape those women you know oh god and you go fuck me you know, and there's nothing you can do but fly into a range and go, no, he didn't. How, why would you say that? Well, I've read it in the New York Times or the here or there. Yes, yeah, she has. Because this, this is a concerted thing 
to organize what we the people believe to be going on in the world and to print it and to keep saying it over and over and over again. And as Goering said, if you tell the big lie often enough, people will believe it. And they have believed the big lie about Assange. And part of the reason that nobody, not nobody, but that there are only maybe, I don't know, 100,000 of us or something over the world who are going, what? This is insane. This is a great man, a great journalist, a great publisher, a great human being, and a great thinker. He should be on a a statue in front of the houses of, in Trafalgar Square. Take fucking Nelson down, you know, that one-armed blind bloke, and stick Julian up there, right, regarded by the lions of the British Empire. And, and, and obviously he's not. And why? Because of what Ray and John have explained to us, he is an inconvenient truth to the oligarchs who run the world for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. And so he has to be removed you think the trial is a foregone conclusion you think the judge is gonna is, it is is going to it is going to Ferris, uh, unless she is gone you think she, she's not even listening to him first of all they've stopped people giving evidence i know people who would try to go to the court to give her they've stopped journalists going to cover it unless they're the paid hacks from the New York Times and the Times of London and the Washington Post and all the rest of the mainstream media, they're allowed to cover it, but they won't. That's why they're allowed to cover it, because they know that they won't, because they've been told not to, so they don't. So that's, the, so yeah, of course it's a foregone conclusion. You know, the, the tragic thing is, what, the, what happens then? Well, that's I mean, a question. How, can, can anybody look at the travesty that's gone on in the Old Bailey in London over the past 17 days, working days or whatever, and tell me that she hasn't made her mind up? Every breath that she took, every word she uttered in that courtroom said, I'm going to find this bugger guilty and send him to my masters in Washington. They can kill him. We've had a bloody good try. We've had him locked up for no reason at all in a high security jail where he's been subject to almost certainly of catching COVID-19 in there and dying. Plus, plus he's been tortured as Niels Meltzer said so eloquently in his, in all of his reports and as uh, reported by our friend K Craig Murray, who's also been, uh, you know, covering the, um, the goings on in the courts over there now. So I'm, you can hear, I can hardly speak with the rage that I feel, that the world no. just doesn't go, are you fucking kidding? No, what no. are you talking about? This has nothing to do with the law, nothing to do with justice, and certainly nothing to do with what might be good for we, the peoples of these United Nations. This has nothing to do with... 1948 and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Julian yeah. Assange is a human being. He has rights. Are they being afforded him? Not one scrap of his human rights is being afforded no. to him. No. And they're just telling people, ignore it. We own the media. We own the machinery of propaganda. We are big brother. We run the Ministry of Truth and you will do as we tell you. Even if we have to persuade the young lady with her glass of white wine that Julian yes. Assange is a rapist. Ooh, there's something distasteful about him. They bought it, these fucking morons. You know, you made a comment at a previous, the previous uh, panel that I had on Zoom. You made a comment about it's time to stop being so polite and nice about these things and to express the rage. And I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I, th I think it's true. And Ray always talks about you know, uh, was it Thomas Aquinas, I think, uh, uh, quote about if you're not angry, you know, then, then, then you, that it's a sin not to be angry in cases like this. So, John, you know what? What? It, it, sorry, uh, I'm going to interrupt you. Because go ahead. Of Ray, let me interrupt. Talking of Ray, right, um, I've got video of Ray going to ask a question of David Petraeus 
a, a Q and A in some. Maybe it was in that Jewish place on Ninety Second Street. It was somewhere up there, anyway. All he wanted to do was to go in. He had to forge his identity, even to get a ticket to get through the door. That's how open they are at Ninety Two Y about answering. Was it there, Ray? I can't remember. It was. That's so where he gets there. He's done all, he's gone through all of this stuff he learned in the CIA about getting into meetings so that he can ask a question of some awful murdering United States Army General, David Petraeus. And they, but they cop him at the door. What do they do? Break his arm well, practically, throw him to the floor, put him in handcuffs and take him to prison. And he still wouldn't shut up. He still kept talking. He still wouldn't know, shut up. Crazy old fool. That question. They couldn't get the man to shut up, even as these goons were jumping on him. Yeah. <laughs> he kept talking. I know. No, it's, it's, it's insane. John, what do you oh, think is going to happen? Films. What do you think is going to, John, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, uh, I, I assume you agree with what Roger said that the trial is a foregone conclusion. But then, what what, what happens next? I mean, I, you know, I wrote this book about the Holy Land Foundation, five Palestinian Americans who were sent to to these terrible prisons here, these, these you know high security prisons here in the United States, and they're completely innocent. Do you think that's what's going to happen? Do you think he's going to come here and stand a, a, some kind of a trial? And what what what, what do you expect? Well, first of all, let, let me say that what Roger said about how this judge, she's not really a judge, she's only a magistrate, uh, but she's uh, certainly a puppet. Uh, can, you, can, you explain having, the, can you explain the difference? Uh, to a mag well, a magistrate is, is lowly, is, it doesn't have to have a jury. Uh, uh, a judge doesn't particularly have to have a jury. But if there was a jury in this case, the thing would have been thrown out on the first day, of course. So a trial uh, of I've watched her. A trial of such, so a trial of such incredible importance with such incredible consequences, yeah. and it's not even a, a full judge and jury. No, 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 it's not. It's going through the system, and at the bottom of the system is the magistrate's court. They're very powerful people. Uh, the, the chief magistrate, uh, one Lady Abathnot, husband, is so connected with uh, the 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 uh, defence establishment, so called, and the arms business in Britain, uh, that his connections were part of WikiLeaks exposure. She had to stand back because of this. This is a judge that, when Julian first came before her, she abused him. Uh, she had to stand back. And in came this uh, rather strange, gothic-looking creature called uh, Vanessa Barreza. Now, when Roger when Roger talks about how she's made up her mind, that's he's right. I watched her. I sat through most of the seventeen days in the public gallery, uh, disguised as a member of the public, not a member of the press, uh, and uh, I watched her after argument uh, between uh, truncated argument but from the defense the defense's arguments were as they say guillotined at half an hour that's all they could use so a witness had only half an hour to say their piece the prosecution on behalf of the u.s government had up to four hours now cross-examination usually does have more but the, the disproportion of this, she would sit there uh, uh, feigning, taking an interest, and then she would open a laptop and read her decision, which had already been written. And that happened time and time again. Uh, that's why it's not agitprop, it's not rhetoric to call it a show trial. The only difference with a show trial, the kind of Stalinist show trials that went on uh, during the Cold War, was that the 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 uh, defendant actually stood in the court proper in the dock. Julian wasn't even allowed to do that. He was in a glass cage, effectively. It was a corridor at the back of the court, and the only way he could communicate with his lawyers was to get down on his knees and push a post-it 
through a slit or talk through his mask to uh, a junior lawyer who would then pass the note through the body of the court up to the barristers who were, who were arguing the case against his extradition, extradition to an American hellhole. That's how it was conducted. Uh, it was a show trial from beginning to end. Uh, I mean, that's very important. This is not just um, a description. So I say it's not just agitprop on our part. That is an accurate description of what happened. What will happen? Uh, okay, he's, uh, uh, she says he is to be extradited. <clears throat> there will, I have to say, we hope, uh, Britain has a Home Secretary at the moment, that is a, the equivalent of an interior minister, uh, who is probably the most extreme, certainly the most extreme in my memory. Her name is Pretty Patel. Um, she seems to hate all humanity and undoubtedly hates Julian. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's an appeal, I understand, is at her discretion. It, there will be an appeal, and the hope for Julian, I've always felt, is that when it goes into the Court of, court of Appeal, into real courts, and there still are real courts, uh, some of these crusty old, even very conservative judges, uh, some of them do have actually a belief in the law, in justice. I'm sorry, John, uh, I just, can you clarify this again? So. So, so if this judge decides to extradite him, his yeah. lawyers will, will request an appeal. It will appeal. It'll be appealed either way. Even, even, even if a miracle happened and, and Barrett um, you know, had some lobotomy or something the night before, uh, then, uh, and, and found for Julian, then the US government would appeal. It will go to appeal regardless. And that's when it goes down the road uh, into the Strand to the Royal Courts of Justice, where the the uh, the, the the Court of Appeal is. And but you where said you, are... you, you said that the Interior Minister it's at the it's at her discretion. As I understand, it's at her discretion, but that may well be a formality. But look, may I don't know. Uh, it could it could well. Um, you know, where these people, the people running Britain are true extremists. And I say, I don't say that lightly. I say, Can I ask a question. Yeah, uh, go ahead, right. please. Yeah, yeah, Roger, go ahead. Is, yeah, yeah. is the appeal court, is the appeal court, would that be a jury trial or is it to no. say three no. judges or something? three judges? Right. So it's like three the American judges. system where the court of appeals is like a, a a, a panel of three, but they're yeah. three real judges, they're not barristers. Judges. Not barristers. Right. I mean, not no. not not magistrates. They're they're they're, they're judges. They're yeah. uh, and occasionally, uh, occasionally, though, even at that level, um, but it's called the high court. These judges make political decisions. Of course, they do. But I've seen them actually make decisions based on the law. Uh, if if that fails, it could go to the the UK Supreme Court, which used to be called the Law Lords and is no longer. It's now the Supreme Court, uh, which has a certain, in its short life, kind of liberal tradition almost. So the point. The, the point is, through all of this, Julian is going to be in solitary confinement in Belmarsh prison, uh, denied, um, de denied any real stimulus in his life. Why is he being They're held? Why is he being held in? Why is he being held in a cell while this is going on? Why does he have to be in prison during the procedure during the proceedings? Why because they say he's a flight risk. Take away his passport. The most famous face He's on earth. Not a flight risk. risk. They want to. They want to. This is the beginning. This is punitive. Of course it's it just, is. But legally, is there no argument that his lawyers can make to to, to counter that? You know, 
this is this is a utterly lawless era. I mean, I think that's what we have to say here. It's a lawless yeah. era. I didn't think I would sit through. I've sat mo through most of the 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 um, the court hearings for Julian uh, last year and and this year and this latest one. These are these are lawless events, uh, and uh, to the point where you hear seasoned lawyers, the people who are part of the establishment called QCs, Queen's Counsel, you hear them say things I never thought I'd hear uh, them say about the system, the judge, the court, the magistrate, the court, and so on. We're through a lawless period because it's an extreme period. These are political, this is a political court. This is the political trial of this century and one of the great political trials of certainly of my lifetime. It's often compared with Dreyfus, but I think it's much, more, much <laughs> more clear cut and important than Dreyfus, the Dreyfus trial mm -hmm. represented. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so, so it, that's Julian's hope that he gets into the court of appeal and a judge goes against the grain yeah. because it's a mighty grain to go against. Ray, you've, you know, let's talk a little bit about whistleblowers. Uh, Ray, you've worked with whistleblowers. You know a lot of the whistleblowers here in the United States and what has happened to them. Can you talk a little bit about his, his work and, 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 and the whole issue of whistleblowers as it relates to Julian? Well, very briefly, uh, that's the idea behind this whole sh charade, is it? John Pelger taught me how to say charade rather than charade. Do you remember, John? <laughs> okay, anyhow, that, that's the, the idea. We have, to quote, we have to quote you when you finish, Ray. We have to quote you on that. When I first interviewed you in 2003, <laughs> but carry on, sorry. Okay. Um, for once, I think I was right. Uh, but, you know, it is a charade or a charade, and uh, the whole point of it is to be as brutal as you possibly can, so no one else will even think about doing what Julian has done. I mean, Panetta has said that they've all said it. Look, we have to make an example of this guy. Now, that has nothing to do with the law. That has nothing to do with the First Amendment that we used to have. That has nothing to do with the Magna Carta, for God's sake, 800 years ago. And so the whole system has been corrupted. And the idea of this charade is to make it so painful for Julian that he'll either do away with himself, fall to COVID-19, as uh, our mutual friend Craig Murray has suggested they really want, uh, and not make it through this appeal process. Uh, I, my own personal view is that if Julian didn't have Stella and those two beautiful little sons to live for, uh, I think, well, let me put it this way. I think he does have them for live for. And I think that, that John and, and Roger will know more, but I think that may play a role in his, uh, in his determination to get through this thing. And uh, that's all I'll really say about this, but uh, the whole thing is uh, designed uh, as an example. Don't even, try, don't even think of doing what Julian Assange did because it was too dangerous. Now, think about COVID-19. Now, the Army warned, uh, the U.S. Army warned its troops that, you know, this thing is going to be awful. There are going to be almost 200,000 people killed. That was early February of this year. Did anybody leak that? Did anybody just, I mean, hardly classified. Did anybody have the guts to say, oh, we ought to get this out so that people know? Well, with what's happening to Julian and the quasi-dormant state of WikiLeaks, uh, you don't want to take a chance, okay? Because they're going to get you. And that's the whole purpose of this thing. Yeah. And you know what they're doing to Julian? Let me, there's, there was a BBC reporter who was asked by one of the few who actually answered a question like this, why the BBC wasn't covering this. And his view was, well, the proceedings are rather repetitive, aren't they? I mean, I found that obscene, profane. One on one day, which was not covered, I would call it the medical day. It sent shivers 
And I, both Craig Murray and I were sitting together and we wondered if we should even write about it because it revealed the depths of Julian's despair. Uh, but it is out now and we've, we, that's the day that Professor Michael Kopelman, one of the world's leading neuropsychiatrists, uh, said that Julian would certainly find a way to take his own life if he was sent to the United States. But another witness, Dr. Kate Murray, uh, another distinguished neuropsychiatrist, said, and this is what they've done to him, said Julian's intellectual function had gone from, quote, the very superior range, unquote, to significantly below average. That's what they've done to him. Now, having seen Julian and visited Julian in Belmarsh, I know that's not the whole story because the man has a formidable resilience, backed by a wicked sense of humor and a sense of himself and the world. But they've got to him. They, I had to revise that when I heard some of the evidence of Julian having written last notes to people. Uh, and that, as this is now out, they had found razor blade in his cell and so on. All the, all the, all the, 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 the clues to what we know uh, happens to so many prisoners in oppressive, when a court is no longer a, a court of justice. So the prison allowed razor blades, the, 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 prison, the prison authorities allowed razor blades into his cell? No, they didn't allow it. In fact, they charged him. They, the, the, prosecution, the prosecution tried to argue against this. The prosecution tried to say to these distinguished people, who know what they're talking about, who had examined Julian, who had examined Julian, came for the defense to describe the state he was in. The, pros the prosecution, uh, I, I mean, in this day and age, we're finally recognizing that mental illness, illness, uh, mental anguish is so widespread uh, that we're starting to to take a civilized approach to it. In this day and age, this barrister dismissed their evidence about Julian's anguish and despair that could lead to his suicide as malingering. That was the term he used, malingering, a Victorian term that they would have used in asylums and bedlam. Uh, and, and but the man, the man has been hurt so badly, um, as Roger mentioned, Niels Melser, the UN Special Reporter on Torture, uh, said that he was in no doubt that he'd been psychologically tortured in the same way that Chelsea Manning was. And they only let Chelsea Manning out because she tried on the day before they let her out, she tried to take her own life. Um, this, this, this is, they, we're talking about societies that are apparently still called democracies and civilized. Uh, we, should put out, we should put out, there's the, there's the report by the UN Rapporteur on torture. Uh, there's a link to that. Uh, I'll ask Jamil and Michael behind the scenes to find and put it in the chat so people can read. Uh, can, re can read it. It's a very revealing, it's an excellent report that people should absolutely read. Why haven't they seen it? You know, this is the thing. They're, nobody's seen it. It's been there for months and months no. and months. We all read it the minute it came out. And went, well, well, actually, that, that was the next thing I was going to ask you. Obviously, Rob. they have to let him go tomorrow. It's quite clear. Why are they fucking around? Why is he still? And now, and of course, for listening to you guys and what I know myself is, it's obvious why they're not letting him out, why nobody takes, why that information isn't disseminated by the New York Times or the B the BBC. Oh, my God, don't get me started on the BBC. 
The, the BBC is a complete sham now. It's a mockery of what it was supposed to be. And it's paid for by the people, for God's sake. It's paid for with taxes from the British people. And yet it's become a complete sham. There's unbelievably um, slanted uh, uh, program that John Ware made for BBC. This is completely another subject, but about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, which oh, yeah. is a shocking put up job. And just has just been it's floated away on the clouds of rubbish that come out of the Ministry of Truth yeah. and to never to be seen again in in public. Well, it will be seen again in public because people like you and you and you and you and me are going to make fucking sure it's seen again in public because yeah. we can't live with the disgusting nature of the deceit. BBC having become completely corrupt. I wrote to the BBC and suggested that we make another panorama programme showing the other side of the argument about um, alleged anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. <laughs> they didn't even answer. Not, yeah. even, not even an answer. But I write to people often. I wrote to, a, I wrote to the Foreign Secretary. You talk about the Home Secretary. The Foreign Secretary is a guy called James Hunt. When I was wanting to go off to Syria to rescue some children whose father had gone off and, you know, he, he, he was a bit of a jihadi. They were from Trinidad and Tobago, two little kids, Ayub and Mohammed. We finally got them out. I wrote to asking help from James Hunt, the then foreign secretary. He never even answered my letter. I could send it to you. Give, mm. Though I say it myself, it was extraordinarily eloquent and very well written. I did go to a grammar school, you know. <laughs> you know, but, so we have to understand is they don't give a fuck they're not as john said they have no interest in the law or protocol or democracy or liberty or human rights or any of the things that they pretend to hold dear they have no interest in any of all magna carta that it took an american on our panel to bring up <laughs> Article 29, no man shall be blah, 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 save that he appear before a jury of his peers and all of that. 1297. Well, actually, Roger, you preempted the question I was going to ask, I was going to start with you is, how the hell do we get the word out? How do we make sure that more of the people who do think or, or, or maybe are on the fence on this issue and are willing to hear get the damn information? Because it's out there, like you said, the report is out there. That. Miko, my friend, is the $64,000 question. Yeah. The, why don't we get it out? Why doesn't it get out naturally and people go, oh, that's what's going on. Well, this is ridiculous. Let's put a stop to it. Well, the answer is that the Ministry of Truth is enormously more powerful yeah. than we are in putting out its propaganda. They get to millions and millions of minutes for every one person that you get to they get to 200,000 it's yeah go come on ray way in brother no, i just wanted to uh, to uh, adduce a small example of uh, of this in a very meaningful way uh, last time i was with julian uh, it was just before the us election about a week before and uh, he was just completely uh, spent but he was happy. He was happy because he had done his job, okay? And he had just given an interview to a fellow named John Pilger, and it was an excellent interview. Sent about to uh, the BBC and then other places, correct me if I'm wrong, John, and John couldn't pay these people to run the interview. He couldn't, he, he couldn't get anybody to take it, so it ended up on RT, which is not ideal, okay? But that's how bad it is, all right? But Julian himself felt, you know, I've done everything that my conscience uh, made me do. And whatever happens with the U.S. election, that's OK. Let's have a beer. And we did. Um, that, that spoke to me about Julian. Uh, he was in this to, to, as you say, spread the truth around and in an unadulterated way. And I mentioned that left handed compliment from the CIA before. Uh, it's a perfect record. All right. And, uh, and it just seems so clear why the powers that be are after Julian, not only after Julian, but 
hell bent and determined to make an example of him. So none of us, no, so no. How, how do the great unwashed, all those millions, billions of people out there, how are they to know that we five are telling the truth and the ministry of truth is telling lies? Well, how let's do we get that across to them. One, just, way would, one way would be if anybody ever listened to the evidence and said, well, support your theory. Yeah. And then we could get yeah. under those circumstances. We can prove there was no chemical attack in Duma. We can prove Julian Assange never committed a, a crime of any kind except one minor bail infringement. We can prove these things, you know, we can prove them. We the the facts are on the side of truth. There is empirical data to support our stance. We are not conspiracy theorists. We are lovers of fellow human beings, human rights, and the truth. And Julian, uh, Julian exemplifies and epitomizes all of that, which is why we're all so passionate, uh, so passionately furious, so angry that they're killing him because he is a great man. He's one of the great men of our generation. Anyway, sorry, I was going on again. No, I, I'd say well, he's a great man. Now, uh, what I would like to do uh, is to invoke the, uh, the NOAA principle. And I've invoked this with my colleagues and veteran intelligence professionals for sanity um, to no avail. But the, the NOAA principle is no more awards for predicting rain, awards only, for building arcs. Mm -hmm. Now, we're all frustrated. We're all pretty bright, you know? Can we not find some way to force this into the public consciousness? We've tried, we keep trying, and the truth is on our side, but I can't resist thinking that somewhere there's some kind of idea that would germinate, and like some is that in the Soviet Union, or like WikiLeaks up until now, we can get this stuff out. And uh, how, don't ask me, I'm just trying to ask everybody to think about building arcs rather than predicting rain. Well, uh, look, they're after him, Ray, uh, and they're treating him so appallingly, uh, Julian, and they are punishing him so viciously because what he did and what WikiLeaks has done has been effective. Don't ever forget that. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been effective, they wouldn't have given a damn. Uh, they're after him because he released the kind of information that did inform millions of people all over the world. And we don't have the time here that there isn't to describe the impact of WikiLeaks revelations mm -hmm. in every country in the United Nations, uh, from Northern Ireland down to Argentina, across to Australia, to, to into up to Kenya, right across the world. Now we can't, we don't know how to quantify this, but it must have been effective. We know it's been effective because it re its revelations, uh, for example, in Tunisia, its revelations about the regime in Tunisia undoubtedly contributed to the downfall of that regime um, during the so-called Arab Spring. And, and there are many others. Now, um, I don't think we should despair too much. I think we're doing it here and now, doing programs like this, uh, um, kicking the door of, the, of the, the BBC and the rest of them, shaming them as much as possible. They're not spending too much time on them. They're part of the problem. Uh, and propaganda now, is universal. As I mentioned at the beginning, all the cracks, the spaces have closed. It's now propaganda 100%. Uh, but there is this wondrous thing called the internet that we're all talking to each other at the moment. Uh, and 
millions of people are aware of Julian. Um, we may know quite a few who are not aware of him, or as Roger described, and that's not an uncommon situation where that uh, silly woman uh, uh, talked about Sweden uh, with such uh, uh, certainty uh, when that was part of the setup to get him. Uh, WikiLeaks only re own revelations about peace-loving Sweden revealed it as, in effect, part of NATO and up to its neck with the US. So, in a way, WikiLeaks was revealing, was giving us the sense of what was about to happen to Julian. WikiLeaks is the arc. WikiLeaks is the arc. <coughs> Julian is Noah. <coughs> he built the fucking arc. And they can't bear the fact that the ark is, if you I don't really like biblical references. No, I'm a bit worried. Here, you know, it's not the way Ray looks, it, it almost, it almost. This is, this is a, I'm, not, I'm not sure looking I can agree with this. Looking at Ray, it's hard to avoid biblical references right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you're right. No, I'm not done. No, you're know, right. Ray started. Which right. question? Ark Ray, and Noah. Yeah. yeah Gentlemen, first, I have to say, what do we do? How, how do we five and all the others, hundreds of thousands, millions maybe, like us, how do we compete? How do we persuade people that what we say is the truth and that it is supremely important that people begin to understand that what we say is the truth? Because, you know, Julian is what we're talking about here now, but these fuckers are destroying the planet faster than is imaginable yeah. in front of our eyes. And, and they're going, oh, look, there's Kim Kardashian's bum. Let's look at that. And, and so, you know, I'm yeah. sure it's lovely that Kim Kardashian's bum, but <laughs> it's so much more important to look at the fact that they are destroying the planet. There's nowhere for our grandchildren to live. It will be gone. Everybody will be dead, gone, finished, over. And the reason, the re the, pr probably the main reason that Julian is having to suffer so much is, as an example, it is meant to intimidate. And there is something called the Assange effect. And the Assange effect has happened throughout the world. I've, I was in Australia recently. The Australian Federal Police... Um, uh, in invading the Australian Broadcasting Corporation offices, taking away journalists' uh, computers, laws coming in that uh, uh, allow uh, courts in camera to, to uh, uh, making, in effect, the sum of it, making journalism a crime. And, and that's why getting Julian is so important because it'll intimidate uh, journalists like me, for instance, or others who um, who who have have uh, are committed to to write being just old-fashioned journalists, investigative or whatever, but just being journalists. It will change it so that it makes a jour most journalists. It'll make it official. They're all public relations people from here on. Most of them are now anyway, but the whole lot will be. And First that, they came for the Jews, then they came for the gypsies, then they came exactly. for the communists, then they came for the journalists, and then they came for you. Uh, Gentlemen, I, I want to... He's the tip of the... He's, you know, he's the spearhead of this, except that yeah. coming for the journalists is so fundamental to our capacity to survive. That yeah. it, that's why we're here. Well, gentlemen, I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to, I think it's a good place to uh, allow for some questions. Um, we're not going to take too many, although there are lots of questions in the, in the, in the Q&A thing. So Jamil, would you hop back in and maybe pick the best uh, few and um, let's get this going. Go ahead, please. Sure thing. The first question is from Janet. The question is, what has happened to the WikiLeaks infrastructure that Julian designed? Is it shut down? No, it's not shut down. And uh, it's, uh, it has an editor-in-chief. Uh, 
uh, in Christian Hrafsen, uh, who took over from Julian. Uh, obviously, a lot of energy is going on um, on on uh, on defending Julian, but it certainly hasn't shut down. No. So, and he's people... from Iceland. They're the only people who imprisoned their bankers after two thousand and nine. So true. there's a lot yeah. in Icelandic blood for us all to aspire to. I've met him. Obviously, he's a good man. Mm. Are they publishing information? Is WikiLeaks publishing more material? If people want to access it, do they? What do they do? Well, it, it, it's difficult at the moment because it's mainly publishing about Julian. Yeah, you know, it has to. This is the most important issue. Of course, you know, he goes WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks will probably survive, but but Julian must not be allowed to uh, to sink. And a lot of WikiLeaks is energy. And the people in WikiLeaks is devoted to, to uh, defending him. Yeah. Go ahead, Jamil. The next question is from Rania. I would like to know when did journalism or the role of journalists change? Did it happen at a specific historical time, like a shift that took place in order to control the media worldwide and shut down truth and real news with the purpose of creating this nasty, unjust world we are living in? When was the beginning of the end of true journalism? From news, from, from providing news to providing PR and entertainment, I guess, is the question. John, you want to start with that? Go ahead. Yeah, I don't think there's ever been so-called mainstream true journalism. Uh, we, we, if, you, if you pick up a, a very good book like The First Casualty by Philip Knightley about uh, how wars have been reported, and he goes back, he's, he says the only, and he makes... It's an excellent book in that he describes uh, all the coverage of wars right from the Crimea in the mid 19th century. He said that's the last British war that was reported honestly. <laughs> uh, and uh, since then, uh, right through the Second World War, the, the cover up of, of Hiroshima, one reporter, Wilfred Burchard, uh, broke from the pack to go to Hiroshima to report the effects, the true effects, the atomic bomb. The, the New York Times reporter was up to his neck with the, uh, with the US uh, occupation people and the atomic energy people and had put out these stories that uh, the only uh, casualties, the casualties had been caused strictly by the blast. There was no such thing as radioactivity. In fact, the headline in the New York Times said, no radioactivity in Hiroshima ruin. So that's 1945. Uh, and it's gone back well before that. Korea was reported uh, uh, mostly as propaganda. So it's not new. We must understand that it's not new. But we've come a long way since then. And the arrival of all of us have learned something. The generations have, have progressed and the arrival of, of WikiLeaks uh, has, I think, exemplified the, the quest of new generations for real journalism, a break with the old. And that's what WikiLeaks has done. Go ahead, please. John, you know an awful lot more than anybody else about Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, would, you, would you agree that uh, a censorship uh, went on steroids uh, with respect to Vietnam and uh, later embedding journalists and all that kind of thing? Is there a difference in kind between Vietnam and earlier, or is it just a, a simple progression? Uh, there was a superficial difference. Uh, which seduced a lot of reporters. Uh, it seemed that you could go anywhere and see what you wanted to, and that was a true. That was true, up to a point, as Evelyn Waugh wrote of Lord Copper, uh, uh, up to a point. But if you take just the My Lai Massacre, uh, which happened in 1968, 
when there were something like 200 reporters in Saigon. Not one of them, not one of them wrote that story. It was only Seymour Hirsch, who never went to Vietnam, who bothered to interview uh, Lieutenant Calais and all his people who had done this, done this war crime and pieced together the story um, as, as a, a maverick, uh, not a very well-funded journalist at the time. He wasn't, he was a freelance. So um, that, that was, that's one of the great stories of Vietnam. The whole, I mentioned earlier, the collateral murders were common. I wrote about a forms of collateral murders in Quang Nai province in Vietnam. Um, it, it, the, the anger directed at me later by journalists on, for example, Newsweek and others, particularly in the United States, because in Saigon, whenever you went into the bureau offices, they would have on the wall um, pictures that were never published of, of, uh, of war crimes, stories, their own, the, the original copy of stories that good reporters had sent, which were turned down by editors. So one of the reasons that Vietnam actually went on for as long as it did, uh, contrary to the, the, uh, the received wisdom that the media brought that war to an end, it didn't, uh, uh, was, uh, was, was the fact that, that by and large, the reporters, perhaps not in the field, but certainly in New York and in London and in the newspaper offices, were on side in the same way the New York Times is permanently on side, as the Washington Post is, and as the Guardian is, and so on. By the way, you mentioned Seymour Hirsch. I'll say two things about him. Number one, his memoir, Reporter, is out, and he talks in a lot of details about how he exposed the My Lai Massacre, which is it's a great book. I recommend it. And he's also a journalist who can't get a, a word into any, any regular newspaper anymore. You know, he can't publish, nobody will publish his work because it's, it's like you, John. It's, it's the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, the powers that be don't want, uh, don't want out there. Yeah. Jamil, should we, and maybe you guys can put out the, uh, the link to, uh, to reporter if anybody wants to check out that and, and his work on Milai, a lot of his articles are still available online about that. Mm. Jamil, you want to go ahead and, uh, maybe we'll take two more questions and then, and then that'll be it. Sure. This one is from, uh, Constantine and this one is, uh, directed at Roger. However, I think, I think we can probably open it up to Ray and John as well, if they have something to say. So, uh, the question is as someone who's heavily influenced by the works of Huxley and Orwell and admits that their predictions about the present world are correct. How do you think we can move away from the current dystopian state of affairs? Assange is clearly an effective member of the resistance but his efforts are continuously put into shame by the officials, as is the case for many other activists, just like in the books by those authors. How do we win over that? Well, education, clearly. We have to completely change our education policy and start educating our children. Uh, I live in the United States. It would be a very good thing if they started there. If every child went for start, for start with, you have to start funding education. You have to give money to it instead of spending it on building nuclear weapons or, you know, sending F-16s to the Middle East to kill Yemenis. If you spent that money instead on building proper schools and paying teachers and educating, and the, and the children in those schools, it should be absolutely required reading 1984 and A Brave New World, among many, many other books, that there's a great deal of wisdom out there in the world of literature. I suspect that Cy Hirsch's uh, book, or whatever, will find its way onto that list at some point. Let me just finish, Ray. Just let me finish. Um, uh, I've forgotten what I was going to say now because he stuck his finger up. Go on. I'll, I'll remember while you're telling us. I'm sorry. Uh, That's all right. <laughs> no, matter. I just wanted to uh, paraphrase what you've just been saying, and that is our children uh, need to know, as you've eloquently stated, they're still killing the children. 
Mm. They're still killing the children. Absolutely. That is manifest. And our children have no way of learning that. And I'm not saying first graders, but I'm saying high school and, and up. Yeah. Uh, we, have to, we have to let them know that mm. they're still killing the children. I've remembered what I was going to what I was going to yeah. say as well in America anyway, and it's probably it's true all over the world. In the UK, we should be taught about our settler colonial past and what we did to the world when we were the power with the uh, power with all the hegemonic powers and the, and we practically destroyed this planet single hand. Well, the UK and the French and the Belgians and the Germans and the Dutch mainly mainly from Europe. It's happening now in Palestine, you know, as we all know, settler colonialism. American children have to be taught the history of the United States of America. None of them know anything about it. But then none of them know, or most of them know nothing about anything. They don't know where the Yemen is. They could, most of them can't point to England on a map, never mind Iraq or Vietnam. So they have no idea. They live in this isolated little um, hegemonic um, uh, organization that, and where, where they happily feed all, the, all their work, all their effort to Jeff Bezos. So he can pontificate about us all living in space and spaceships, fucking prick. You know, <laughs> it, it's so absurd. Anyway, so I can't remember what the question was now. What do we do? <coughs> Educate our children, you know. And stop killing them as right. And, and, and the thing is, with the educating the children, I, I, you know, as a parent, and you know, we we need to talk to our children as well. We need because they're not like Roger was saying very clearly. They're not getting. I mean, they, you know, even if they do study 1984 in high school, we need to talk about these things at home every day. Show them how we vote. Show them why we vote. Show have the discussions about politics. Have the discussions about the environment from an early age, get them involved and get them to care and get them to know and take them around. That's how we, that's how we, we, we change the story because then they grew up and they changed the story. And also, you know, we widen our own networks. We have to talk to the neighbor and we have to talk to the neighbor's neighbor. And then we have to get together with those two neighbors and bring somebody from across the street who maybe still has a Trump sign up. You know, we have to do this one person at a time and then grow the network and organize in a way that people do get that information um, that's out there and that their children get involved and come in and listen, not you know sit in, in the next room, watch TV, but come in and be part of the conversation. I think so that's how we... To... Sorry, go on. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, so we're talking about breaking down the, f the famous wall. We have to break down our own personal walls yeah. before we can engage with our fellow human beings. And we have to do this, not just between us and our children, but across the boundaries that exist between us and the bloke who lives down the street and people who live in other countries and between the settler colonialists, us, and the people who lived there when we came in and started killing them. Because it's not certainly my generation wasn't wasn't taught anything about that. We just assumed that the British Empire was all right. You know what's wrong with that? And there's a couple of you, couple you of great. Learn, and, you, and you learn about it, and then suddenly you start to get a cold feeling of going, "Fuck me, we did we did that. I did that. We did that." And then you start to learn that there is no such thing as race. That we're all Homo sapiens probably started in Africa a couple hundred thousand years ago. We're all brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter if we look Chinese or Mongolian or African or European or whatever. It doesn't matter. We're all, we're all cousins, all of us. And we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same arc and we're sinking. We are sinking. The and there are a couple of great, there are a couple of great songs out there. One that talks about uh, being uh, just a, being just another brick in the wall. And there's a, and one about being comfortably numb that I think uh, Roger may have had something to do with both of these songs. And I think people need to listen to the lyrics, listen to the words, because the words have a great deal of meaning. I know the, 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 the comfortably numb is something that we see all around us. That's exactly the problem is that people are comfortably numb. Well, I did, I did an interview with my friend VJ Prashad the other day, and he made the whole interview about one song of mine, The Gunner's Dream. And, yeah. there's, and he reminded me that there's a couple of lines in it, which, you know, um, and which go, um, 
a place to stay enough to eat somewhere old heroes shuffle safely down the street where you can speak out loud about your doubts and fears. And what's more, no one ever disappears. You never hear their standard issue kicking in your door. You can relax on both sides of the tracks and maniacs don't blow holes in bandsmen by remote control. And everyone has recourse to the law and no one kills the children anymore. And I, and I thank VJ to remind me that I wrote those words in 1984. Yeah. So listening to the lyrics of some of these great old songs, you know, especially with, especially with, um, if we're talking about education, this is, uh, this is education. This is part of, part, part of, uh, part of the legacy that's out there. Should we take one last question, Jamil? You guys have been very generous with your time. I think we'll take one more and call it a day. Sure. And thank you to everybody who submitted questions and apologies for not being able to get through. You know, we had like over 80 submitted. So this one is from Ellie. The question is, in a world that takes truth as a threat, do you ever feel pressure when speaking your truthful mind? I believe people get scared into agreeing with lies and popular opinions on the Julian Assange topic for the sake of not being hated. Truth as a threat. Wow. Gentlemen, why would you go all, all around everybody? I'm just well, going to truth is a threat. The truth is what we've just been talking about, which is basically we, we, if we're going to have a civilized society and, and literally save the world, uh, but those of us, especially those of us who live in powerful societies, have to look in the mirror. Looking in the mirror is critical. And that's what our education doesn't do. Our journalism has almost never done it. It's looking in the mirror. If we looked in the mirror and understood what empires do, the British empire that Roger has referred to, uh, it's carnage instead of this ridiculous, benign idea of, of empire that is still promoted, the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer started to talk about patriotism uh, and the empire all over again. How can he get away with this? You know, that the quality of public discourse is so low that, that people can actually start praising the empire. Look at the American empire. Uh, Americans, as Roger was saying, don't even know they've got an empire. Boy, have they ever. They've got the biggest empire. They've, they've, done, they've done more damage in their empire uh, in in a relatively short space of time than other empires uh, controlling the destinies of other people, plundering their resources, denying their children food and education, destroying their environment. That's what empires do. Uh, you know that, Mika, because your country is the product of empire. Uh, and that's that is is, uh, is 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 something that has to be addressed at every level of public education and information if we are to become a truly civilized society. And even the word civilization was, of course, uh, appropriated by the imperialists. But there is a word civilization that applies to humanity. Will only be that if we look in the mirror. Thank you, John. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I would just uh, amen, amen to what John just said. And uh, no one has mentioned uh, the real F word, fascism. Mm -hmm. uh, when John Pilger first interviewed me 17 years ago, can you believe it, John? He ended up with a, with a question about Fascism. I think you referred obliquely to that before, John. Do you want to? Did you want I've, to got it. I've got it exactly. I've written it down. I asked Ray um, what he made of Norman Mailer's remark. Norman Mailer was still alive then, uh, that America had entered a pre fascist state. And Ray answered, I hope he's right, because there are others that are saying we're already in a fascist mode. 17 years on, Ray, what do you think? Well, I'm afraid to, uh, to say that it looks like uh, this whole business of uh, suppressing the First Amendment and the free speech is an integral part of fascism. It's sort of like the necessary step 
And that's what we're dealing with. I mean, make no mistake about it. Uh, once, they, once they make sure that we have to believe everything in the New York Times and there are no other outlets, then it's going to be a piece of cake. Then it's going to be a cakewalk to institute full fascism in this country and then elsewhere. Roger, you want to end with uh, a statement about that? that was a, I thought that was a great question. In, in, in reality, thought, in a world where truth, I, is, truth I, is a threat. Go on, say, say it. I'm just on. saying, in, in, she, he was saying, in a world where truth is a threat, how do you not, how do you not be afraid to stand up and speak as, as you do? Well, I thought John and Ray's answer to that question was fascinating mm -hmm. in that they totally ignored the question. <laughs> because they are unafraid they are truth tellers and they are unafraid and that makes me feel passionately proud to be sitting with them and you on this webinar you know it reminds me of the story i constantly tell about my old mum saying you're going to come up against tricky questions during your life when i was about that big and, and she said um when you do Look at the question from all sides, get all the evidence, gather it together, right? And make certain that you've got the facts and the whatever. Then you will have done all the hard work. The easy bit comes next. You do the right thing. Wow, what a great gift that woman gave to me. But that's what they do, Ray and John. They, they know a lot about a lot. And what do they do with their truth? their actual true knowledge of things, they do the right thing. And that is what we must expect of ourselves and of all our comrades and brothers and sisters all over the world. Fuck the consequences. If you don't do that, you might as well be dead, in my view. Yeah, so we've had, uh, I was just looking at this panel, gentlemen, you've been incredible. We've got uh, a journalist, um, we've got a whistleblower, and we've got a, uh, an artist, a musician, a poet. So I think this is a great, uh, this is a great combination. I'll say, you know, people talk about uh, courage and, you know, being an activist and being courageous. I think, I think in the case of at least the four of us, um, you know, being white males in this world obviously gives us privilege. And, and, and I think the important thing is to use our privilege wisely and to use our privilege to expose the truth. Um, because for other people who perhaps are not as white and, 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 and male, it's not, it's not quite as easy. But all three of you have been terrific, very generous with your time today. And your work is uh, phenomenal. I think the issue, um, I would ask everybody to tweet today and to use the free Assange ha hashtag. And if we all do it and maybe do it for a while, it's gonna get some, we're gonna get some traction. Um, this is going to be available on YouTube very, very soon. So you can share that with people. I think some great things have been said in this, on this panel. So again, uh, John and Ray and Roger, I can't thank you enough. And um, let's hope that we see Julian Assange free and soon. I'd just like to thank John and Roger for all the good support they have rendered to Julian and to his legal team and to all the other people fighting for justice. You've been a real beacon and an encouragement for the rest of us to pick up where, where we can and try to help. So thanks, John. Thanks, Roger. And thanks, Miko, for getting us together. Yeah. Sure. Learned a lot today. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a nice day. Have a nice... Thank Bye. You. Take care.